ladies and gentlemen, Catherine Rue. Second time at the Secret Society of Twisted Storytelling. Hey, you two, what are you doing there? My father walks in on us. It's obvious what we've been up to. On the low table where we, my mom and I, are hunched over, he can clearly see sheets of paper filled with my clumsy handwriting practicing the Japanese script. You shouldn't teach any Japanese. Don't ever study Japanese in this house. Do you understand? I became intrigued about Japanese when I was just a first grader in Korea. On my way to school, I would always pass a public bathhouse. One day, near its entrance, a sign appeared advertising some new equipment from Japan. This sign included a few foreign scribbles, which I took to be Japanese. Curious to know what it said, I asked my mom to teach me the Japanese alphabet. But seeing how upset my father was, I understood. Japanese is something I should never, ever study, even though my dad and mom spoke Japanese to each other. It was their secret language. Whenever they switched to Japanese in our presence, their children, we knew they were talking about something very, very serious. After that incident, I stayed clear of that forbidden language until I was ready to go to graduate school in my mid-twenties. And Dad is not pleased. Why, Kathy, of all the languages you could study, why, just why, Japanese? I wanted to study Japanese art for my graduate training. As an undergraduate, I majored in Western art history and studied French. I did my junior study abroad in France, where my father had also studied. Dad was particularly pleased that I loved French, a very special language between us. Ma chérie, qu'est-ce que tu vas faire ce soir? Comme toujours, je vais étudier le français avec toi, papa. It was my father who first taught me French. I learned to speak French before studying how to read or write. My father was an applied linguist back in Korea. He then used a new method with pictures and audio tapes only. Now, my father is 87 years old and lives in Long Beach, California. Recently, we thought he lives by himself. Whenever I visited dad and mom while she was still with us, I would always go through the same phone ritual with him. Dad, really, I can easily take the airport bus just pick me up at the transit center in downtown Long Beach. No, 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 Kathy. I have nothing but time on my hands. Let me have the pleasure of picking up my youngest child at the airport while I still can. I'll be there. The moment I see my father, come out of his car with a beaming smile. I immediately feel back home, even in the middle of the hustle 
and bustle at LAX. About 20 years ago, my parents retired and moved to a new place. It was from a large two-bedroom condominium where we, their four children, grew up to a sizable one-bedroom apartment. And that's when I started to receive packages of various sizes from my dad, even when it was not my birthday or Christmas. I still recall the very first package I got. Curious, I opened it right away. My college diploma, my high school yearbooks and class pictures. Oh my gosh, all those report cards too. All A's. Oh, what's this? A book report. I wrote in Korean when I was a sixth grader. Dad and mom had kept even this and brought it with them when we immigrated to the States. My family came to this country in 1977. It was 40 years ago, and I was 16 then. My parents wanted to give us better opportunities for higher education, but they did not have the financial means to send all four of us to the States and support our studies. So when an opportunity arose, they sold our little house, packed up the most essential things, such as my elementary school assignments, <laughs> and left friends and relatives behind to start a new life in L.A. 20 years later, they began to downsize the life they had since built in this country. And I, too, started to downsize my personal life by getting a divorce. <laughs> It all happened in my mid-30s. I first mentioned my impending divorce to my father when he visited me, thinking and hoping that he would surely share it with the family. Later, when I briefly visited home, I learned that he did not breathe a single word about it to anyone, not even to mom. During the prolonged and painful divorce process, he rarely reached out to me. Being vulnerable state, I sometimes would ask myself, does dad even care about me? About 10 years ago, my parents moved again this time to a small one-bedroom apartment, and shortly after, to an even smaller unit. Packages begin to arrive at my door again from my dad. By now, it has become a routine. But still curious, I opened it immediately and find the old familiar books about Korean culture and history. And I pick up the phone and call him. Hi, Dad. Another package of books has just arrived from you. Thank you. Oh, Kathy, good, good. Do you like them? You should keep them. You are the only academic in the family. There are a few more here. I'll send them to you soon. OK, send them away. I hang up knowing that I have no time to read those books. <laughs> but I love hearing him say, you are the only academic in the family. <laughs> I feel like it's his code word acknowledging our special bond between us, even though he was not happy 
with my choice of specialization, Japanese literature and culture. <laughs> my parents' shedding process had gone on like this for a while. They moved again, giving away more of their possessions matching them with what each of, uh, of their children had become as adults. Then last summer, another box came from Dad. I didn't know he still had more to give away. This time, it's heavier and larger than the previous ones. Opening it, I see dictionaries of various sizes a very old Korean Korean dictionary, another old Korean Korean dictionary, a Korean Chinese dictionary, and so on. And then I pick up one of the larger dictionaries. It's quite hefty. And when I turn it over to read its spine, I cannot believe my own eyes. A ja Japanese, Japanese dictionary. <laughs> I am holding a copy of Koji N, or a vast garden of words. It is one of the most authoritative single volume Japanese dictionaries. I know this. I have a personal copy of my own. I bought this dictionary of over 2,200 pages only after I knew for sure that I would specialize in Japanese studies. It was in 1990. I had then just finished my two-year study in Tokyo, Japan as a graduate research fellow. And I even consult this dictionary even now. But why? Why did my dad even get this dictionary in the first place? I set aside his dictionary and walked to my bookshelf. I pull out my own Kojian dictionary from it, and I put two volumes side by side on the floor. I now take a closer look at them. My father's dictionary is a second edition, published in 1964, showing its age with wear and tear. My dictionary was a third edition, published in 1984, still in good shape, with its cover and case both intact. I let these two dictionaries commune with each other in silence, sharing their stories while I imagine my father's. Why has he kept this dictionary for all these years? And why did he send it to me? By the time I started my graduate studies, I, of course, knew why he did not want me to study Japanese. My father was born in 1929. That means he spent his formative years when Korea was under Japan's colonial rule from 1910 to 1945. All Koreans were then forced to learn and speak Japanese. But to my father, Japanese was more than the language of the colonizer. His own father, my grandfather, whom I never met, was a leading educator of the time and an anti-colonialist. He was incarcerated by the colonial regime suffered physical hardship and passed in his 40s. Since my family moved to this country, 
My dad has held a series of jobs that did not suit him. First, a used car salesman. Then, a real estate agent. Finally, a freelance interpreter of English and Korean. This hefty Japanese Japanese dictionary had absolutely no practical value to him. If he had simply tossed it, tossed it, it's heavy, tossed it into a recycling bin, it would have saved him from packing and unpacking it many times over. The pages of his dictionary are now yellowed, its spine broken, its cover lost. I see that Dad has made a makeshift cover for it using a brown paper bag. In my mind's eye, I see Dad looking for suitable material for the new cover, finding a clean brown paper bag, he measures the dictionary and cuts the paper bag to the right dimensions. He then dresses the dictionary with the cutout pieces, securing them gently with pieces of scotch tape. On his wide spine, he is now writing out three large Chinese characters for Kojian with a felt pen carefully adding each stroke in his signature calligraphic style. I now gently stroke the makeshift cover of my father's Kojian dictionary, the very figure of my father. I then vaguely remember seeing numerous Japanese books on bookshelves in his small study back in Korea. It is true that Japanese was the language of the colonizer and the oppressor, but it was also the intellectual language for him. Does this mean that his Kojian dictionary embodies his love for learning and respect for knowledge? Is that why he could not simply abandon it? Or has he been waiting for the right time to part with it? Now that time has come, he wanted to give it to someone special. And he gave it to me, the only child who has studied Japanese and who could understand the symbolic value of what he's leaving behind. Could this then be his way of saying that he has been quietly rooting for me for all these years, despite his initial opposition to my decision to study Japanese? After having communed deeply with my father's dictionary like this for some time, I finally pick up the phone and call him. Hi, Dad. Another box of dictionary has arrived from you. Oh, Kathy, good, good. You like them? Yes, thank you, especially for the Kojian. Now it's on my bookshelf. I'm wondering, Dad. Why did you keep this for all these years? What? Kojian? What are you talking about? I don't remember any Kojian, but there are a few more dictionaries here, and you should keep them. You are the only academic in the family. <laughs> I'll send you some more soon. OK, send them away. I hang up. I then repeat to myself his words. You are the only academic in the family. How many times have I heard him say this? 
But it suddenly means so much more to me now, knowing that I am the designated inheritor of his cherished Kojian dictionary. In my Korean family, we do not verbalize our affection with the direct declaration of, I love you. So now, I joyfully take my father's habitual saying, you are the only academic in the family, as his code word for, I love you. My father has been with me all along through thick and thin, even through the Japanese language. Catherine Rue. Thank you.